last time I think I was dealing with the eighth mantra. Yes. And eighth mantra over and we also and uh, we just briefly dealt with the ninth and tenth mantras. These mantras have got one special characteristic. They have been interpreted differently by different philosophical schools. Shankaracharya of the Advaita tradition interpreted in one way, the Manijites and the followers of the Visistha Advaita tradition and also Dvedins, the followers of the Madhva school. And in later times, in the 20th century, Aravindu gave his own interpretation. When you read all these interpretations, one may be struck by, by a special characteristic of this Upanishad. What it exactly is the real meaning of this, or the implication of these verses. So, by way of explaining this, I shall make a few important remarks. In fact, the Upanishad gives a road map, it gives a, the picture of the evolution of a man's spiritual and philosophical progress. Now, depending upon our own evolution, our own attitude towards our life, our own individual life, and our, our attitude and approach towards the world at large, external world, and our concept of God. These three are interrelated. So, when you look upon the text from this standpoint, we, can, we, we have to uh, go back to Swamiji's interpretation, Swamiji's analysis of a man's spiritual progress, where he says, then one begins his spiritual journey with the dualistic, approach and moves through the non the qualified non dualistic or visistha advaitic tradition and ultimately culminates in advaitic or monistic realization this is what swamiji said that in that context swamiji says we are not moving from error to truth but rather from truth that's lower towards truth that is higher. There is no such thing as an error, in fact. By error we mean incomplete or partial understanding of truth. So, the dualistic and qualified non-dualistic approaches imply the first two stages of a man's spiritual progress. And the Advaitic realization implies the ultimate or the, the zenith of one spiritual and philosophical evolution. Now, there are two terms used here that you find a vidya and a vidya. These are very commonly used in Vedantic tradition. Vidya normally means knowledge and avidya means ignorance. This is the general understanding. Avidya can also mean maya, in the sense it's due to our ignorance that we think that this world is absolutely real. When we get rid of this ignorance, we understand this world is only relative. And maya implies relative. Avidya also implies the relative. Now, Vidya, the word Vidya is interpreted differently in two different ways in this Upanishad. In one context, Vidya implies knowledge, but knowledge of the relative. Let us say, say a man who, uh, or a person who thinks this world is real, 
or the relative knowledge is real. So science, technology and all other branches of learning related to the empirical life, phenomenal life, which help us to lead a comfortable life, which help us to conquer the forces of nature and turn these forces of nature into tools in our hands with which we increase our comforts and make our life uh, more happy in an external sense, in a purely empirical sense. This is one sense in which the vid word vidya is to be taken in this Upanishad. This only in a relative sense. In the absolute sense, vidya means the knowledge of the supreme reality, the knowledge of the supreme consciousness, the knowledge of Atman or Self, which takes us across the ocean of ignorance, ocean of samsara. You may come across certain words in the translations of this Upanishad. I have just used one sentence, ocean of samsara. Samsara means world, ocean of world. I didn't, you know, or going beyond life and death. Such terms you find in this Words. Vinasena murtyum tiyutva, such word you find. Svidya amrdam asnuti, such expressions you find in this condition. Now, what is the implication of crossing the ocean of samsara? It needs a little explanation. Samsara in literary, in literary sense means that which uh, comes and goes, samsara, the iti samsara, that which flows, that which is changing, that which is not eternal, which is peripheral, which is phenomenal or which is empirical, relative. That's what is meant by samsara. It doesn't imply the world alone. The world is changing but it also implies the phenomenon of human life. And it is related to the theory of rebirth or theory of reincarnation and the law of karma. In Vedantic tradition, an individual soul goes on moving from life to life. Like just imagining a cycle or a wheel. In fact, the word is samsara chakra. Chakra means wheel. It's a wheel of the cycle of human life and death. Now, whatever we do, thinking that this world is real, we do with attachment. We do with, a, with a, an element of selfishness. This action, it may, the, the action need not necessarily be physical action. It may be verbal action, speaking. It may be mental action, thinking. Or it may be physical action also, of course. So any of these actions done uh, with the deliberation, with the identification that I am doing this, will be based on another mental process, thinking process. I want to enjoy the result of this action. I am the doer of this action and I am the enjoyer of this action. Any such action, verbal, mental or physical, will leave its mark, its impact in our mind. And then we will, our character also will be formed by these actions. If you read Swamiji's Karma Yoga lectures, you can get a very beautiful description. Swamiji gives an elaborate description, karma and its effect on human character and so on. All these lectures are fine. So whatever we do, we leave its mark in our mind. The word mind is sometimes called chittam in the, in the, in the traditional vocabulary. So, and if that action produces good result, we will have a tendency, we will be tempted to do it again and again, even if that's not necessary. If that action produces unpleasant result, 
then we may try to avoid it even if that action is very important and very necessary. So this action influences our character, forms our character. And based on this char- and based on these actions, character is formed and depending upon the action, depending upon the character, our action also will be uh, formed. So actions constitute character and character influences action also. And then accordingly we when we die our our mind will be will be influenced by the totality of all the actions that we have done whatever thoughts actions or words we have spoken a gist of this will come to our mind when we die that is a even geeda even yam yam vaapi smaran bhavam tyajatyanti kalai but i don't want to quote too many things tat tam tame vaidika undeya sada tad bhava bhavitaha shri krishna tells arjuna see whatever may be the thought with which you die accordingly you will be reborn and your action will be accordingly i can uh, ex- I, I emphasize this point uh, by giving a small narration based on the bhagavata purana and the first book is called first skanda this story i won't go details parikshit was a great king it so happened that he committed a terrible crime or a sin by mistake not willingly as a result he got a curse that he will live only for 7 days at the end of the seventh day he will die and will be he will he will be killed by snake bite that was the curse he got and then he was a wise man he gave up his kingdom his royal palace went into the banks of ganga and started doing tapasya he he understood there are the, the, maybe only seven days are left seven into 24 hours so that much only i don't want to waste my time a normal man if you are told if a man is told well you are going to live only for one month then also he be terrified but parikshit was a wise man because he had done a lot of good holy deeds in his life so he decided that he will live as a saint for the last seven days of his life and he went to the banks of ganga so all the great sages of that he that those that that time came to know of this episode they all came to the banks of ganga to see parikshit this great king of them there was one great sage he was named as shuka and shuka is the teacher in the bhagavata purana shuka is the son of the great vyasa who classified the four vedas and is the author of the all the puranas just the shuvan shuka himself arrived parikshit was overjoyed the great the greatest sage of that those times arrived he right in front of him so he put a question to this great sage the question is no i would like to ask you one question what should a dying man do what should a dying man meditate upon what should be his thoughts how how should one face death ath prachami samsiddhim yoginam paramam gurum purusha seha yat karyam priyamanasya sarvadha this is that sanskrit verse the literal translation is this no i am going to ask you one question you are the greatest yogi of this age and then he goes on asking questions see whom should i meditate what should be my thoughts what should be my action and what is the best way the most intelligent way to face death and if one can master the technique of death he can also master the technique of life because people do wrong things because they forget the reality of death they somehow do they are seeing death taking place all around them every day every moment still 
there's an internal conviction and that is what is called that is the power of maya or illusion delusion that life is eternal and this misconception leads a man to wrong deeds and wrong thoughts and wrong actions so this great text teaches us that death is a great teacher of the mystery of human life and the mystery of human death also and the answer is given in the next book next section of the purana second skanda it is called first chapter the um uh, shuka gives the gist of the answer in one shloka of course the answer is more elaborate because shuka asked a few more questions what should a dying man do and what he should not do both questions he asked that is the last part of his question please tell me what a dying man should not do now i am going i am not going to all those details but i i shall give the gist of the answer shuka gives the answer etavan sankha yoga bhyam sudharma parinishthaya janma labha para punsam ante narayana smriti the answer is ante means in the end at the end of life when we breathe our last at the time of death one should remember god this is the goal of human life this is possible three alternate paths are prescribed by this great sage one through the path of yoga karma yoga jnana yoga bhakti yoga and so so through the through or through ashtanga yoga or through advaitic vichara means the advaitic path of uh, discriminate discrimination between the real and uh, unreal everything else everything else other than atman is unreal atman or self consciousness the supreme reality is the only reality everything else is uh, unreal in the sense only relative this is the second path the third path is perform all our actions with a sense of surrender to god surrendering the fruits of action to god the results of action to god because we are normally not attached to actions we are actually attached only to results of action so this is the prescription given, given by the great sage and then so he says and ante narayana smriti means when one is breathing his last he should remember he should be able to remember god if any path enables you any mode of life any path of life enables you to die with god with the thought of god in your mind the holy name in your hearts then that is the best way to die that's a question that means that's answer given to the question put put to the great sage by the emperor means what should a dying man do what should be his thoughts what should be his actions now in all these three parts one important point is uh, to be remembered we have to live in this world but we should never take the world as 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 the supreme reality as a goal in itself as an end in itself it is a means it's a tool but at the same time it should never be taken as a supreme end in itself this is the gist of the answer given by this great sage the whole purana it's called bhagavata purana the greatest of the 18 uh, scriptures called the puranas this is the gist of that great work and the entire book is nothing but an exposition of this idea how to die with uh, the thought of god in our hearts that is the subject now in this context one may ask the question how to uh how to develop this conviction this uh, the, the the this uh, understanding that god 
is the only reality and everything else is uh, only relatively real or they are only relative. There are scriptures, including the Upanishads, explain three levels of a man's understanding of the world. A primitive man who has not spiritually evolved at all thinks that the world is real. The material world is real. A very, very primitive man. A scientist will not, uh, will not tell you that the world as we see is real. He may, he may tell you that, well, it cannot be real as you see it because it is changing, but he may not be convinced of the reality of the supreme consciousness or self or Atman. That's a different matter. But he'll be fully convinced uh, of the unreality of the relative world in which he lives. There's no doubt about it. So, at the primitive stage, a man thinks the world as he perceives around him is real. At the next stage, he comes to the conclusion, when he uses his intelligence and his intellect, he comes to the conclusion that the world as we see around and as we experience around cannot be real as it is, but we can't say it is unreal, so it is unsaid. It is uh, indescribable. In Sanskrit, it's called Anirvachaniya. That is the second stage of man's understanding of the world, according to Vedanta philosophy. The first, he thinks the world is real as it is. At the second stage, he thinks the world cannot be real because no intelligent man, no educated man will be foolish enough to say that the world as we see around is real as it is. Because real means remaining without any change. The world is certainly not that. At the third stage, he comes to the conclusion that there is something beyond this world, something that we cannot pursue, and that alone is real, and everything else is real only in a relative sense. So, the so at the beginning, he thinks the world is real. At the second stage, he thinks it is indescribable. At the third stage, he thinks it is only relative. Relative means mithya or maya. These are the three levels of a man understanding of the world. Depending upon this, he uh, conceives his idea of God as well. At the beginning, a man uh, may think that God is one who creates this world and sits apart from this world, and supervises this world. That, that idea is not wrong. Vedanta doesn't say any idea is wrong. Vedanta says, but this is only a partial understanding. At the second stage, he thinks this world is created by a God who is, not, who, who is an abstract ideal, who cannot be known, who cannot be pursued. And the third stage, he understands God is the supreme reality and there is nothing other than God. And God is only all-pervading, omniscient and immanent and transcendent reality. And we are, in essence, non-different from that God. It means we are uh, just uh, different expressions of that inner spirit. This is the this is, this is the road map to, towards the highest concept of God and also to the most, towards the most scientific understanding of the world. So this should be understood here. So as I said, first the, the word avidya is mentioned by, mean, by, by which the Upanishad means ignorance. Then vidya is mentioned and this word vidya is to be interpreted in two different ways. In the relative sense, vidya means understanding of this world, the secular knowledge. And in the absolute sense, vidya means the real supreme knowledge of the self or Atman or the supreme consciousness. This much if you keep in mind, then these three 
four slokas will become very, very clear because these slokas are a bit abstract. <coughs> now, I have already explained uh, this, uh, this ninth sloka. Antham tama pravishandi ye avidya mupasate. So the mantra means this. Those who pursue the path of avidya, ignorance, mechanical action, without any concept of the transcendental. Without even the concept of a God with form who creates his world. Such people enter the world of darkness. Antham tama pravishanti. They enter the world of darkness. Then, those who think that the supreme reality is, those who limit the supreme reality to the level of a minor deity who answers your prayers for material benefits alone, they enter a world which is much more dark because their progress for, I mean, their, their road to further progress is permanently blocked. So a man who has no idea at all, you can give him, you can teach him. A man who is who's fully convinced of a wrong conclusion, who is, who, is, who is obsessed with a wrong conclusion, is difficult to teach him. So that's why such people enter a world which is even darker than the earlier world. Then, then the same word is used in the tenth mantra, Anya Devahu Vidya Anya Dahu Avidya. Idi Susrumadhiranam E Nastat Vichachakshiri. I will read the prose order. Vidya. Vidya here means the result of Vidya. The result of supreme knowledge. There Vidya stands for supreme knowledge in this mantra. I told you in the very beginning, Upanishads present a serious difficulty in terms of the language used in explaining high philosophical truths. So Upanishads were framed at a time and in an age when language was in, its, in a state of infancy. It be, it's the Sanskrit that's used in the Upanishad literature is very, very archaic. It was, it, it, it is a language which uh, we, we, in which there was no definite uh, rules of grammar. In fact, the famous grammarian, Panini is name, lived in the 7th or 8th century BC, before Christ. And Upanishads, uh, were, Upanishads must have been formed around 3,000, 4,000 years before Panini. That means or almost uh, 6,000 years or 7,000 years earlier. So, the standardization of Sanskrit grammar and the rules and regulations uh, took place almost 3,000 years, uh, uh, 3, years after these Upanishads uh, came into existence. That's why language is highly fluid, archaic. So sometimes they had to use the same word to mean different things, very often in the same stanza or the same sentence. I will, those, who, those who are interested in Sanskrit grammar will be surprised. Uh, the famous, there is a famous statement uh, by a great interpreter, commentator of the first uh, important work in the world on etymology. It's called Ashtadhyayi. It means a work with eight, eight chapters. That's the standard book of Sanskrit grammar by Parnini. So... And before that, there was another book, Yaskas Nirukta, that also was there. Yaskas Nirukta was a little earlier, but Yaskas just took a few verses, about less than 500 uh, couplets from Rigveda, Rigveda Samhita and gave interpretation of, the, of some of the terms used in those mantras. And Rigveda Samhita contains uh, more than 10,000 uh, Riks means small, the, the smallest unit of Rigveda Samhita. More than 10,000, almost 11,000. Between 10,000 and 11,000. And Yaska, uh, the great 
commentator of the Veda Mantras, first commentator. He inter he explains only around less than 500 of them. Just imagine. And there is a famous commentary by Durga Charya. There he says, "Pravaktu ko vividhya prakarana vividhya cha asya arthasya anena bhavida." I am going to those details. They are not relevant, but just give an idea of the. Problem of language in the Upanishad literature. So I'm giving. So this great commentator says the meaning of the word in the Vedic literature has to be interpreted according to the context and also according to the person who uses it in at the time of chanting or recitation. So it means it was highly fluid. The language had not become a standardized uh, grammatical structure. It did not have a standardized grammatical structure when the Upanishads were written. That's why the same word can mean different things, not only in this, not only in, in, a, in a text, in a book, but also in each mantra. In each, sometimes the same sentence uses the same word in two different uh, meanings. So that's, uh, that's a problem. Okay, good. So, Anya Deva Ahu Vidya Anya Ahu Avidya Idi Susrama Dhiranam Yenastad Vichachakshire Here Vidya Vidya, according to absolute, absolutist philosophers, means the knowledge of the supreme consciousness. But there were ritualists in ancient India who used these mantras to perform external rituals. They used to pray to different deities, different gods and goddesses for empirical worldly pleasures. According to them, this, month, this Vidya will take you to Surga. Vidya Devaloka means Varga, according to them. But according to a philosopher, according to a true spirit, true seeker of truth, this Vidya is that learning which takes a man beyond the cycle of life and death, which I mentioned earlier, and beyond uh, all that is relative. That is the real sense in which the word Vidya is to be taken, according to monistic philosophers. So, that's meaning. So, Vidya Anya Deva Ahu Avidya Anya Deva So, the result of Vidya is one thing and the result of Avidya is something else. This is the opinion of the great sages of the ancient times. Ye Naha Tad Vijachakshire Tesham dhiranam iti. Now, we have heard this from the great sages who have taught us the supreme truth. What, is, what was their teaching? The result of ignorance, the result of ignorance of the self is one thing. What is that? The end, moving through this cycle, this wheel of endless life, death and rebirth and the game continues eternally. Till one realizes, till one stands apart and asks the question, who am I? Is, this, is there nothing beyond this life of actions, sufferings, enjoyment, again actions, and then death, again rebirth, Again, the same uh, the, the repetition of the same cycle. Is there nothing beyond this? Am I just a, a helpless board tossed about by the mighty waves of this cycle, this mighty wheel? Just an insignificant creature which is forced to move along with this cycle, mighty endless cycle of life and death. Is there nothing beyond this? Only a philosopher or a spiritual aspirant can ask this question. Till one seriously starts this inquiry, this cycle continues. That is the result of avidya. And vidya is the, what is the result of vidya? Vidya is the result of coming, is the result of uh, true spiritual inquiry. And as a result of vidya, you come out of this cycle. And Vedantic tradition prescribes three important paths 
ಫಾರ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಔಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೈಕಲ್ ರಾಜಯೋಗ ಕರ್ಮಯೋಗ ಭಕ್ತಿಯೋಗ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಜ್ಞಾನಯೋಗ ಜ್ಞಾನಯೋಗ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎ ಫಾತ್ ಆಸೆಟ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಸುಪ್ರೀಮ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಸೊ ಆಸ್ ಎ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯೋಗತ್ರಯ ಒನ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕಮ್ ಟು ರಿಯಲ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಸೊ ಸಮಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಕೇಸ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯೋಗ ಅದರ ಈಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಯೋಗತ್ರಯ ದ ಈಸಿಯಸ್ಟ್ ಪಾತ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಈಸಿಯಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಸಿಂಪಲ್ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಫೆಸ್ಟೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಿದ್ಯಾ ಈಸ್ ಕರ್ಮಯೋಗ ದ ಕರ್ಮ ವಿಚ್ ಬೈಂಡ್ಸ್ ಅಸ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿಚ್ ಬೈಂಡ್ಸ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಎ ಟೂ ದಟ್ ಬ್ರೇಕ್ಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಚೇಂಜ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಟೆಕ್ನಿಕ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ಮಯೋಗ ನಾರ್ಮಲಿ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ವಿ ಡೂ ವಿ ಸೆಲ್ಫಿಶ್ನೆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಡೂವರ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಎಂಜಾಯ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ವಿ ಡೂ ವರ್ಬಲ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಫಿಸಿಕಲ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆರ್ ಮೆಂಟಲ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಥಾಟ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ಮೇ ಬಿ ದಿಸ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಬೈಂಡ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಐಸ್ ಐ ಸೆಡ್ ಎಲ್ಲಿಯ ಇಟ್ ಲೀವ್ಸ್ ಎ ಇಟ್ ಲೀವ್ಸ್ ಎ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ ಇನ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಕಾರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ಲಿ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ಟು ಪರ್ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ದಟ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಯು ಫೈಂಡ್ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಆರ್ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ವಿತ್ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಂಗ್ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ದೇ ಕಾನ್ ಬಿಹೇವ್ ದೇ ಕಾನ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಬಿಹೇವಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಎ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಮ್ಯಾನರ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅನ್ ಇನ್ಹರೆಂಟ್ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ನೇಟ್ ಬಿಹೇವಿಯರ್ ಪ್ಯಾಟರ್ನ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಕಾನ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಇಟ್ ನೋ ಸೈಕಾಲಜಿಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೈನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಇಸ್ ಸಮ್ ಡೇಸ್ ಕೋಲ್ಡ್ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಸ್ವಭಾವ ಗೀತಾ ಸೇಸ್ ಆರ್ ಅನಿಸುದ ಸ್ವಭಾವ ಭಾಗವತ ಪುರಾಣ ಸೇಸ್ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಬಿಹೇವಿಯರ್ ಪ್ಯಾಟರ್ನ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ಕಾನ್ಜೆನಿಟಲ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ಕಾನ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಇಟ್ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಇನ್ ಒನ್ ರೆಫರಿಂಗ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಸೇಸ್ ವಿ 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 ಆರ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ವಿ ಕಾನ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಡ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ವಿ ಕಾನ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಇಟ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ವಿ ಡೂ ಟುಡೇ ಈಸ್ ಎ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆರ್ ಹೇಳಿಯ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಡನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಸೇ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಟೆಂತ್ ಇಯರ್ ಆರ್ ಏಯ್ತ್ ಆರ್ ಟೆಂತ್ ಇಯರ್ ವಿ ಮೇ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ವಿತ್ ನೇಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಡನ್ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ವಿ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಆಸ್ ಎನ್ ಅಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಕ್ಟ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ನೇಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ವೆ ಪರ್ಸೀವ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಇಂದ್ರಿಯಸ್ ಬೈ ಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಬೈ ದ ಐಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ವಿಲ್ ಫರ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಬಟ್ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಅಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಕ್ಟ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಅಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಕ್ಟ್ ಐಡಿಯಾಸ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಫೈಂಡ್ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಫೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಆರ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಅವರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಇನ್ಹರೆಂಟ್ ಬಿಹೇವಿಯರ್ ಪ್ಯಾಟರ್ನ್ಸ್ ದ ರೆಸಿಡಿ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಸೊ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಬಿಲಾಂಗಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆರ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಆಸ್ ಅಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಕ್ಟ್ ಐಡಿಯಾಸ್ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ನೇಟ್ ಬಿಹೇವಿಯರ್ ಪ್ಯಾಟರ್ನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೆಮರೀಸ್ ರಿಲೇಟೆಡ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆರ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ಡ್ ವಿತ್ ನೇಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ವಿತ್ ಫೋಮ್ ದೇರ್ ಐ ಡೇರ್ ರಿಮ ಮೆಮರಿ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಮೋರ್ ವಿವಿಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೋರ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಸೊ ಹಿಯರ್ ದಿ ದಿ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಸೀಸ್ ಅನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಆಹು ವಿದ್ಯೆಯ ದ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ವಿದ್ಯಾ ಈಸ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ 
destiny or fate, if one can convince oneself, then one can come out of it. But it needs a strong will. Swamiji says only Buddha could do that, only Shankara could do that. Then there is another path, that is Bhakti Yoga. If one can do everything and surrender everything, the feet of a God, of an idea of God, maybe any God, in any religion, when the idea of God is a great help in spiritual life, a creator God, if one, you may, if one can surrender oneself and one's actions to the almighty God, then that also helps one to come out of this mighty will. The fourth path is Ashtanga Yoga. Not a Yoga Asana, please remember that. Yoga, Hatha Yoga is only one aspect of this science of yoga. Yoga is nothing but Chitta Vritti, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. It means complete, complete cessation of all mental impressions. But it's a, it, it, it's a, it is a result of a prolonged process. Through this one can come out of this will. So the technique of coming out of this will is Vidya and the helpless condition of being bound to this mighty wheel of the cycle of life and death that is a result of avidya. That is what this mantra, this verse implies. So the result of vidya is different from the result of avidya. This is what the great sages of ancient times have taught us. Then the next sloka. Vidyamcha avidyamcha yastad veda ubhayam saha avidyaya amrtim tiyatva vidyaya amrtam asmiti. So, one who practices vidya and avidya, this is a reference to what a normal man should try to practice in his daily life. That's, meant, that's what is meant here. Avidya here means daily actions. Avidya here stands for daily actions. Because daily actions, normally what a man does in daily life, it creates bondage and bondage is a result of avidya. That's the relationship between actions and avidya. And vidya. Vidya here stands for meditation. Meditation on a personal deity is one sense. A meditation of the supreme being is another sense. If one can combine both, it takes us across the ocean of the endless cycle of life and death. This also has been explained earlier. Today we have to take up the, I mean, the twelfth mantra. We have already dealt with this mantra. Nine, tenth, and eleventh have been dealt with last last Wednesday. Antham tama pravishandi ye asambhuti upasate. Tado bhuya ivate tamu tamu yau sambhutiyam rata. This is a mantra. I should explain. Ye asambhutim upasate te antham tamaha pravishanti ye u sambhutiyam rata. Te tataha bhuya iva tama. Pravishanti. Sometimes, you know, the Upanishad repeats the same idea in a different language, using different terms and terminology. That's So here you find the idea is repeated in a vague sense. Now, in ancient times, there were people who used to worship God in various forms. One important uh, book, it's called Mandrika Kariga. It is a book, uh, 215 verses by Godapada. It's a commentary on the Mandrika Upanishad. Mandrika Upanishad contains only 12, 12 verses. And Mandrika Kariga is a commentary in metrical form uh, written by Godapada. A great Advaita teacher who lived almost 200 years before Shankaracharya, who wrote a commentary in metrical form called Kariga on Mandukya Upanishad. There, Gaudapada refers to 
almost 32 different schools of thought prevalent during his age. 32 different concepts of ultimate reality. So people, there were people who uh, were the worshippers of different deities and there were worshippers of nature, so again pantheistic and panatheistic and monistic and monotheistic and absolutistic. All these schools, you find all the five stages of theism, you, find, you can find in the Mandukya Karika. 32 schools of thought, 32 schools of absolute reality are mentioned there. There were those who used to worship nature in its cosmic form. It is easily mentioned here, Asambhuti. Asambhuti here means those who worship the reality as an abstract formless entity, Asambhuti. Sambhuti here stands for, in Technic Sanskrit, is called Hiranyagarbha, means the Samashti Brahman. I mean, they used to conceive of a reality which is nothing other than the totality of the cosmic phenomena in an, abs in an abstract form. The totality of the entire cosmic phenomena in, 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 ab in an abstract form. These were different stages in the evolution of philosophy and religion and concept of God. And the great writer, Gaudapada, in his commentary con comes to the conclusion that these are all different understandings, different approaches towards the absolute reality. And this difference in approach is caused by the difference in the evolution, in the stage of evolution of different schools of thoughts. So some people used to worship, well, God is nothing other than a spirit. Even now you find some rationalists. Well, I don't believe in a God who creates this world, but I believe in a spirit. A spirit in some uh, subtle energy or power, whatever you may call it. Such people you can find even now. They may not go to a place of worship. They may not um, attach any sanctity to a religious scripture. But they will admit that there is a subtle power behind. There is a supreme intelligence which is behind. Otherwise, you cannot, you cannot explain the world because the world cannot be explained uh, in terms of scientific and technological understanding. That's, that's clear. So there should be some power behind which we cannot pursue, which we cannot understand. And they would also tell you that it, that power can never be known. It is a kind of agnosticism. Such people lived in those days. That is mentioned here. So they were the worshippers of Asambhuti, means a, an, a spirit, an entity which has, uh, which has no which, which has no origin and therefore which has no end, which is abstract, which is eternal. The vague, ambiguous understanding or concept of the absolute consciousness of Atman. That is what it is. That is Asambhuti. Then there were those who used to worship Sambhuti. Sambhuti here stands for the cosmic phenomena that is also abstract but its manifestation is visible everywhere. It is a sum totality of the cosmic phenomena. Not earth only but entire cosmic phenomena. That's what they would tell you. So such people were there in those days. Now <clears throat> Tato Bhuya Ivate Tamo now, those who worship Sambhuti, that means the entire cosmic phenomena, they project a concept of God who is a giver of gifts and rewards. So, whatever you pray for, that God gives you. 
In fact, everyone, it's easy, you know. It's easy to conceive of a God who is um, kind, compassionate, etc. In fact, God is compassionate, no doubt about it. God is compassionate, kind, the sum totality of all uh, conceivable human characteristics and qualities. Sakala guna kalyana vallabha, sakala guna kalyana nithi. Such terms are used by Ramanujais, by Sri Vaishnavas, the Ramanujais philosophers, to explain God. Vedanta does admit God is the ocean of compassion, mercy, goodness, beauty, knowledge, everything. But Vedanta tells you, though it is true, you cannot confine the idea of God within the parameters of these criteria, these characteristics. Suppose you say God is one who is compassionate. Vedanta will tell you God is compassionate, but God is beyond that only. Not that it is, God is certainly not uncompassionate. It is not devoid of compassion. It doesn't mean, it means you cannot define God in terms of a, uh, of a human characteristic, in terms of a characteristic or an attribute which a man intellectually conceives of. That's what Vedanta says. So, this Upanishad tells us here that those who believe that God is one who is uh, compassionate, watchful, and who rewards man with heaven or punishes him with hell. The idea of God is true, but that is not the whole picture of the absolute reality. Because the moment you give a definition, you are limiting your idea of God. And God, a God who can be fully limited, confined within the four walls of a definition cannot be considered to be a transcendental reality. Definition is always a limitation. So, so to imply that God is beyond limitation, Vedanta tells you God is compassionate, but, can, but God cannot be confined, can be limited, can be defined just as a person who is compassionate. That's why Vedantic idea alone takes you beyond the concept of surga, which is called heaven. In Sanskrit, it's called surga, or heaven. Any religion other than Vedanta takes you up to heaven only. Maybe Vaishnava school will tell you, we go to Vishnu's world, Vishnu, Vaishnava, Vishnu Loka, Shiva is Shiva Loka, Brahma Loka, or heaven, whatever you want to call it. Because after all, what is heaven? Heaven is an extension of an ideal life that we can think of in this world. So you, you, if you read the important books, any book, either Puranas or the important religious works of Abrahamic religions or Hindu Puranas, you find, a, you find long uh, graphic depictions of heaven. And all that is available in heaven is available in a five-star hotel. Only point is you don't have to pay rent that sum. So Vedanta thinks and conceives of a God who cannot be defined, who cannot be limited within the four walls of a definition, who takes you even beyond heaven. Because the problem is, um, if you confine God just as one who takes you to heaven, then uh, that God is, becomes just an agency or just a distributor of the results of our actions. Vedanta tells you, God is certainly the distributor of the results of actions. The Atman or the Self, the Supreme Consciousness, conceived as God with form, rewards you for your good actions and may punish you for wrong actions. But at the same time, the ultimate reality, the supreme self or consciousness, cannot be limited, brought down to the limitations of a definition. That's what Vedanta says. So here, I think his time is up, but I shall conclude within a few minutes. 
అంధం తమ ప్రవిశంది ఏ అసంభూతి ఉపాసతే తతో భూయ ఇవతే తము యౌ సంభూతి అమృత ఐ విల్ కంటిన్యూ దిస్ క్లాస్ నెక్స్ట్ వెన్స్డే ఐ వాస్ ఐ ఐ ఐ వాస్ రిక్వెస్టెడ్ బై సమ్ డివోటీస్ టు అనౌన్స్ యూ యూ వాట్ ఎవర్ డౌట్స్ యూ మే హ్యావ్ ఆఫ్ ఎనీ క్లారిఫికేషన్స్ దట్ యూ ఆర్ లుకింగ్ ఫర్ వీ కెన్ పుట్ ఇన్ writing and hand over to our office they will give me and we, i can devote one whole day for interaction and i can write